think we can we can get rolling. I, I do hear some chimes. People are still coming in, uh, but I think in the interest of uh, our guest speaker's time and everyone's time, I'd like to get started. I'd like to welcome you to our 2020 guest speaker program. My name is Mike Yaley. I'm the director at the Lair of the Bear, and I want to thank all of you for joining us for our 2020 virtual content here at the Lair. Uh, we're really excited about our guest speaker program, and tonight's guest speaker has been a long time uh, Lair camper and speaker at the Lair, and we're really excited to have him. Uh, and I'd like to introduce him, and uh, his name is Dan Cammon, and from pandemics to racism to droughts to fires and gasoline prices, climate and energy have become mainstream politics and economics. Uh, Dan will look at the latest science and politics of the global crisis we face today. Dan Cammon is a professor of energy at UC Berkeley, chair of the Energy and Resources Group, and professor in both the Goldman School of Public Policy and the Department of Nuclear at Berkeley, is the founding director of the Renewable and Appropriate Energy Laboratory, and that can be found at rael.berkeley.edu. And in 2010 and 2011, he was on leave at the World Bank in Washington, D.C., where he served as the clean energy czar, and he was appointed science envoy for the U.S. US State Department by, the, by President Barack Obama. Since 1999, Cameron has served as the lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. You can find him at, at Dan underscore Kamen on Twitter. And we are extremely excited to have Dan Kamen with us tonight. Take it away, Dan. Well, thank you so much. And thanks everyone on the Lair team, Kathy and Mike and everybody else. Um, but also thank all of you campers for doing this unusual version. And I was just told officially that if you go to any of the Lair talks this summer, it counts as a year of camping. And so I'm actually gonna remember that. That's the key, uh, I like that a lot. So just wanna thank you all. And um, I guess you're gonna click comments in the, in, in the chat and um, we'll, go through, we'll go through them at the end. But obviously it gets a little impersonal. So if someone has a burning question um, in midway, maybe find some way to you know raise it up and you can interrupt if there's something that just seems like we need to uh, to address it at the time. So thanks, thanks so much. Um, and let me share the screen and kind of go from there. So looking forward to this conversation with you all. Let me just get everything centered here. All right, we're set to go. And obviously, if anything is not right with volume or something, just let me know. But otherwise, I will kind of jump in. So welcome to this talk about the confusion that we're in over climate change and COVID and race, uh, Black Lives Matter. It has been a um, complicated uh, year, to put it mildly, on all fronts. And they all relate together in some ways that I'll try to illustrate as we go. And uh, um, and, and as Mike said, if you're interested in any of the material, uh, the website of my laboratory here, RAEL, R-A-E-L -E dot berkeley dot edu, we have video clips, we have announcements of current events. I'll mention one in a few minutes that's coming up. And as you heard, also the Twitter is at the bottom. That's not actually my individual, that's not my vacation Twitter that we try to put uh, one or two tweets a day up that's about the work in the laboratory and a couple points I'll mention pretty soon will actually be part of what we're working on right now in this regard. And one of the things that might be interesting, particularly for those of you who are used to sending your kids not to KK, but to teens and preteens, is that what I'm gonna talk about today, we actually offer in an online course at Berkeley this summer. You can see the website at the top, ERG, Berkeley, the EDU, Academic Sustainability. This is an eight week class and it's what we call a asynchronous class, meaning that the lectures are all recorded online. There are no prerequisites. So if you or your kids or yourself, um, friends wanna take this class, it does begin this week, um, but there's no specific time. You can take the, you watch the lectures, you attend sections. And so if anyone's interested, that's the website. And I'll put it up again at the end but the course I teach is called Energy and Sustainability, and a lot of the material I'll talk about today actually comes from those lectures. We don't assume any math, we don't assume any physics, any economics. We teach it along the way, um, but the, court, the semester does begin this week. So if you have any of those teenagers at home who are bored but are, 
are science or sustainability uh, geeks, this is definitely something I'd recommend. So uh, take a look. And the other feature, of course, is that the much sadder is that every day we get another event which just kind of puts in, in really horrific um, uh, contrast how many challenges we're dealing with. We thought that COVID was a big deal. Um, and now what we're seeing is a real outpouring on the issue of Black Lives Matter and of, of the impact on our, ourselves and communities. And in my house, this is just critical. So here's my family. Here I am at the protest that started at Oakland Technical High School a couple of weeks back run by the students. And so we debate how these topics interact on a daily basis. And certainly um, we'll talk about them in the course. We'll talk about them tonight. Uh, but we thought the climate energy story was difficult before these things began. And so now we're in a spot where we really have to kind of you know, square the circle and figure out a lot of different features. And definitely in our house, um, this quote from Desmond Tutu um, about what it means to be on the progressive side, what it means not just to not commit racist acts oneself, but to really kind of weigh in and make a positive difference is is part of the story. And it's it's really consumed our teaching on campus. Um, as many of you may have seen, the fall teaching at Berkeley will be online. It'll be asynchronous for many people like this course I'm teaching this summer. And so if you wanna to, to dig in, we're trying to make a lot of the Berkeley content available to people, both students, but also their parents and friends to kind of see what's going on. Um, and so again, as I said, for us, what's been happening is really a personal story. And both of my daughters um, have been for many years at Lair. And so one of the things we would have loved to do this summer, of course, is to be there with you all, not doing it remotely, but I hope we're all learning about our role in both the, the health and COVID story, but also in this broader social social picture that, that's going on. And for my team, my laboratory at Berkeley, this is a kind of a snapshot of some of our PhD students. And, you know, I'm really proud that the laboratory has been cited a number of times by being one of the top destinations for minority students to get their PhDs. Um, in the College of Engineering, where my lab physically sits, you can see it's a pretty diverse uh, pool. But one of the questions that comes up again and again is, what are the things that one can do in addition to not doing things that are actively negative, but to really make a more progressive stance? And that's been hard for many of us. Um, I've taken some of these implicit bias tests recently that some of you might have done. And you find that all kinds of biases are built into our thinking, mine uh, very much included. Um, and so it's, it's hard to figure out where, where to go on this. Um, and again, that's why this class I'm teaching energy and society is one of the examples, but we're also doing one on, on water and waste and justice, one on reading the environmental classics, books like Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, um, and of course in climate change economics that'll come up in quite a few slides going forward. And I think all of us associated with Berkeley couldn't be more delighted that we are once again rated the best public university in the United States. Um, we have an unusually high number of Nobel laureates on campus. Um, and that's part of the, the good side of our legacy. And so one of the things that happened and, and Mike mentioned in the beginning was that I was very fortunate in the work that I was doing when I moved to Berkeley 20 years ago, um, we got involved in climate change research. And any of you who've walked around campus have seen these wonderful signs. You might have thought that the NL reserve meant no loitering. That's not what the NL means if you see those parking spaces. Um, it means those spots are reserved for Nobel laureates on campus. Now, most people, not all, get Nobel prizes when they are fairly old. And so many of the spaces are empty on campus. You can walk in front of, this is in front of Campbell Hall, astronomy. Um, you go in front of Hildegard, um, you go over into chemistry and you'll see a bunch of them as well. Um, but the tradition at Berkeley has been that if you win the prize, you get a parking space. Well, four of us on the Berkeley faculty were part of the team that shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. And so I have to admit, we were kind of licking our chops, thinking that we're gonna get this co most coveted reward, not the money, not the gold medallion, but the on-campus parking, because campus parking is expensive at Berkeley, and it's not on campus for me, several blocks away um, on Channing. But of course we did it for environmental work. So campus didn't do anything. We didn't get our parking spaces. And 
a year went by, five years went by. More recently, campus did finally um, acknowledge us. And so I have this nice plaque on my wall that was not from campus, it was from the Nobel Prize Committee. Um, and I wanted to sort of you know, illustrate my parking. Well, campus thought about it and they finally acted. They did give us parking, but they gave us environmentally sensitive parking. So if you go to the Free Speech Movement Cafe in the middle of campus, you'll see my parking. And there it is, Nobel Laureate Bicycle Parking. And if you read the fine print, you'll see that, yes, we shared it with Vice President Al Gore, uh, but the parking is not even reserved for us. It's shared with all cyclists. And so in a very Berkeley way, I feel like they actually responded very appropriately to, uh, to the prize. And it's a fun kind of version of, of Berkeley sort of figuring out what, what, what we can do here. Um, now, the other thing which has really underpinned a lot of my work since that, since the 2007 um, Nobel Prize, was the work that we did starting the next year when President Obama and Vice President Biden were elected. And it's interesting and it's illustrative of how quickly you can change at a country level. And we like to think that things like our energy system are really slow to evolve. Um, the story out of that IPCC, that Nobel Prize we got, was that the world needs to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 80% or more between today um, and mid-century, mid 2050. We're already in 2020, and so we don't have a lot of decades left. And what happened during the Biden administration is really an interesting version because as someone who had been to all of these climate summits, um, the very famous uh, Kyoto Protocol came out of a summit in the 90s, um, the very famous and very unsuccessful Copenhagen summit in 2015, um, and the, as, uh, 2010, and then the much more successful summit in Paris um, that produced what we call the Paris Climate Accords. And so what came out of the actions taken by under the Obama administration were some really remarkable things. Now, these weren't all due to federal action, but just as all presidents do, you claim what happened under your watch. And during that, um, that, that eight year run, US wind generation went up by four times from 55 to 227 million megawatt hours of power. Um, that's about like ramping up from two or three to more like 30 or 40 um, big uh, nuclear or coal power plants. So wind jumped up dramatically. Solar did even more. Solar increased by 40 times and the price of solar fell by 60% during that administration. So really a remarkable um, set of changes. That's not all. Energy efficiency of which California has been a global leader since the 1970s. Um, has meant that our energy demand has fallen dramatically. More than 10% of a reduction in energy used to make a dollar of GNP. And that's something where California and Japan, Denmark have been real leaders in getting these technologies into the market. Um, and under, actually started under President Bush, but ramped up under President Obama, um, the federal investment in energy research, something called ARPA-E. Those of you know about DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Projects Energy that brought you things like the internet and um, stealth fighter planes and all. Um, a similar effort was started in energy, and this ARPA-E has been hugely successful. One of its outcomes has been something I'll come back to again and again in the talk, and that's called SunShot, and that's an effort to make solar power far more accessible and those of you who have solar on your roofs or on your businesses or friends roof are part of that effort. I mean, they've been hugely important and the energy workforce has been quite dramatically diversified. Um, it was not just all kind of white males like myself um, as it was two decades ago. Now programs like um, the efforts to bring minorities into the energy workforce, women in energy, women in STEM, these have all really changed the dynamic in some important ways. And you can see on the right here, this is one of the White House events I did um, while still Berkeley faculty. This one here is talking on a panel on the mixture between climate change and innovation. And you can see it was opened um, by my predecessor at Berkeley, John Holdren, 
who was the longest serving um, science advisor to a president. He served the whole eight years and you see at the, at the, at the end, um, the closing comments came from then Vice President Biden. Um, during that effort, I was asked by President Obama to join the administration. And so I did join in this role called Science Envoy. It's a bit like a science and technology ambassador. I work directly for Secretary of State Kerry. You can see over here on the far left. Um, and this was a clean energy access summit talking about energy resources in developing countries. Um, here I am with uh, the ambassador to, to Morocco, Dwight Bush, who led a clean US-Africa partnership and then a number of events we did with President Obama along the way to really be a voice in how US government, US universities like Berkeley and US companies could be partners around the world in efforts to clean up our, our, our energy mix and to really follow the lead that uh, the US and China did. Um, in 2014, they signed a record agreement and China and the US until 2014 had been two of the slowest moving countries on climate. We were often considered the dirty duo that held up those climate meetings. Um, but in 2014, the US and China signed a, a joint, a bipartisan pact to become leaders and we really jumped ahead. The US committed to cutting its emissions state by state by one third by 2025 something we've unfortunately walked away from with the current president. Um, and China said they would stop growing emissions. They would peak their emissions in 2030. But with the improvements in clean energy, um, China had said that they're going to peak their emissions in 2025. Pretty impressive to increase the commitment. And as you'll see in a second, China may have already peaked their emissions. And we'll get back to that in a second. That's an interesting, interesting change. So this is that agreement between President Xi and President Obama when they agreed to do this cutting. As I mentioned, that was the 2014 agreement. Um, and what happened instead, unfortunately, is that the US canceled the Clean Power Plan and China may be peaking their emissions uh, last year. And that's largely due to COVID, as you'll find out in a second. But already they had, they had moved their target up from 2030 to 2025. Pretty impressive statement for a country that we all think about as run on coal. So at the end of President Obama's term, uh, term as president, he sent me a very nice letter, which is also on my office wall, um, and we was thinking about what to do next. And then, of course, we had a change of administration. And as I've made pretty clear, that change isn't one in a direction that I most like myself. That's obviously a political statement, but it did disappoint me. Um, and so after uh, Mr. Trump moved in directions that I didn't feel were consistent with that work on clean energy, I did write a resignation letter. And in the standard style these days, I wrote my resignation and to chat with this president, you tweet it out. So there was my letter and I was fairly, uh, fairly angry. So I not only wrote a letter, but I did bury a little message in an acrostic. Um, across the, um, the first letter of each paragraph um, and sent out my message. Um, again, I'm, I'm obviously uh, verging strongly into politics here, but I also tweeted it out. And so I tweeted it out and the, the lesson I had learned from, from social media is that you should send your message out and to amplify it, you know, get your best known acquaintance to uh, retweet it for you. And so I asked the person who I thought qualified in that role. That letter is on Twitter. Um, and the person who I think has the biggest following um, did tweet it out. And I see I've done something out of order here. I really apologize. Um, I'll come back to it in a second. Um, so I did get um, JK Rowling to tweet out my, my letter and it kind of went viral. It got quite a bit of response. I think the slide showing it's coming up in a bit. But then I stepped down and um, came back to my duties at UC Berkeley. I'd actually never left them because I was able to juggle them with a sabbatical, but that's kind of an academic detail. And so I came back to working in state in California. And it's been really um, kind of remarkable what California has done. This is California's state level commitments. And since we are the fifth largest economy on the planet, um, when California stakes out a goal, it has a really large impact. So. The first major climate goal for California um, was to 
get 20% of our energy from renewables, solar and wind, bioenergy, if it's sustainable, and that's a pretty big if. Can't use corn, you need to really use waste materials. Um, it gets a, it's a bit in the, in the weeds. Um, and also geothermal and ocean energy. And those are the ones that qualify here. Elsewhere in the world, for example, in New York State, where I'm from, or China, they count large hydro, big, big mega dams, and they count nuclear as a renewable. We don't. California has a more restrictive definition. And as a professor of nuclear engineering, um, I sort of wish nuclear was um, up to the task. Some people think it is, some people think it isn't. Um, but right now, California is running only one remaining nuclear plant. That's Diablo Canyon. And it will close at least a decade and a half early. It's scheduled to close now in 2024. Um, and so we have transitioned without renewable, without nuclear. Same thing Germany's doing, but I'll get back to that in a little bit. We find a way to cheat a little bit. But California's target to be 20% powered by clean energy by 2010, we missed it. We made that target quite a, three years late. Um, but we also set a target for 2020. And what's impressive about California's target for 2020 is that we met it three years early. So from being late on our 2010 target to being several years early, we've done a remarkable push towards clean energy. California is now at about 37% powered by clean energy. And our target for 2030 was 50%, but we passed Senate Bill 100 two years ago. And that calls for 100% clean energy with, um, by 2045. And it calls for our target uh, for 2030 to be 60%. So that is one remarkable transition for a big economy. Now, of course, we all know California has a wonderful mixture of renewable resources. We have great solar. We have okay wind. It's not ideal. It's nowhere near as good as the Midwest. It's nowhere near as good as Western China. It's nowhere near as good as um, the resources in parts of Northern Europe, but it's reasonable. And California has the world's largest geothermal plant, taking energy from deep, uh, hot rock. And so we've done a neat set of features. And one of them that has really been interesting, it, something I worked on quite hard is that we set a rule that every new home built in California after January 1st of this year has to generate as much energy as it consumes. It doesn't mean it has to be solar, but what it means is that you have to be a net zero on the, on the grid. So most, for most of us, that means being very aggressive on energy efficiency. You can see some piping down here. And it also means uh, generally installing solar, although you could do something else, you could do wind, and gen over generating during the day when the sun is up, buying from the grid at night, unless you also, for example, install a, a battery system as made by Tesla, their power wall, or made by Enphase or others. And so here's a bunch of homes that were, that were, that were finished earlier this year. You can see there's solar on the roof. There's uh, some single family homes and a number of multifamily homes. And these are, generate, are, dr are driven to this by this California target. And so, so uh, here's where the slide's out of order and I apologize. So there's what I mentioned before about working with the president. There's that letter I showed you. There's the, um, the impeachment letter. Um, and I mentioned I got J.K. Rowling to tweet it out. So just apologies, I had dropped these in the wrong order in here. Um, so getting back to the things that we've done, um, California has moved dramatically towards clean energy, but one of the challenges is that while we're on a pace to get to that 100% clean energy target, one of the big economic or political battles, depending how you want to phrase it, is really about the financial investment. And with some universities, um, some big family foundations, the Goldman family in San Francisco, a number of colleges, universities have chosen to divest their finances from renewables. Some notable ones like Harvard and Yale have chosen not to. But in California, here's an op-ed I wrote arguing for a divestment back in 2013. Um, I'm very pleased that the Berkeley faculty and then the faculty across the whole system 
voted to divest from fossil fuels, and that was passed campus by campus. And so at this point, the University of California system is the largest school in the US to have committed to divest. And in a state that's committed to all clean energy, if you don't also divest, you can argue that your electrons are green and clean, but your money is not. And this is, of course, not one where there's uni universal agreement. Um, the votes recently, not only at Harvard and Yale, but now at Stanford, have not been to divest. And so um, to me, that's a little bit hypocritical, um, not just because I like to, to dig at Stanford, but um, in terms of the environmental story. Uh, but here we are at a real leading position. And for those who want to go even further on the politics side, um, this is the advertisement for an event that we'll be doing this Thursday, um, 5 p.m. And this is an event which is not actually part of the Biden campaign. It's organized by a group of clean energy, clean tech leaders. You can see the website at the bottom. Um, and I'll drop it into the chat box. But I'll be doing this as a conversation with Dr. Tracy Osborne. Uh, she's a professor. She's actually a, um, a chair to um, sort of an honorific professor um, at UC Merced, and she works on indigenous peoples and environmental justice. And as you see from the talk, I work on clean energy. So we'll be having this dialogue in support of this effort, just like when President, when, when then Senator Obama was running. Uh, at that point, we were part of clean energy for Obama, and now we're for this one. But if you're welcome, it's a free event, but I, I know this is a verging into the politics. And so I'll, I'll move back to the main to comments. And I highlighted that Biden event because we have seen some dramatic changes. We have seen this, which is Greta Thunberg, who will almost certainly win this year's Nobel Peace Prize all by herself. So she would get parking on campus if she were a 17-year-old professor at Berkeley. Um, but this is her climate strike just two years ago. One person outside the Swedish parliament and the largest collective events on the planet up until the Black Lives Matter strikes were these Fridays for the Future events. There's the Berkeley event that I was at. Here's some of the strikes around the planet um, where young people really took a leading position on climate and not so different than what we're seeing on some of the Black Lives Matter issue. And I bring this up because Academics love to say something. I, I myself have said this in many talks, and that is we have a lot of challenges, whether it's around campaign finance reform or environment or health, healthcare, whatever it might be, and these problems we're leaving to the younger generation. Well, in fact, this climate issue, and again, I would argue Black Lives Matter are cases where young people have absolutely stepped up and they have been instrumental in working towards solutions. And so both I want to salute them, but also we really want to support them in these efforts in terms of thinking through where we are. And of course, the other event that is going to leave a lasting scar in the minds of all kids graduating this year from high school or college, their parents, is the impact on, of COVID. And to, to kind of tie all these things together, this is a paper that we recently wrote with a group of colleagues You'll notice the lead author is actually a friend of mine at Tsinghua University, kind of the MIT of China, if you will. Many of the authors are from Chinese universities. Stephen Davis is a friend of mine at UC Irvine. I'm down here. Hans Schellenhuber is a professor. Well, he was a professor at Oxford before he retired back to Germany. Um, and what we found in looking at greenhouse gas emissions around the planet is there's been a dramatic impact of COVID. Now remember what I said before, the scientifically agreed target is that we must reduce our emissions by 80% or more. Some of us say 100%, some say 90, but 80% is the minimum by 2050. Now, COVID is not a way to reduce emissions. These curves show the comparison between 2019 emissions, the dotted line at top, and 2020 emissions, the lines at the bottom. And for those you know, who have eyes like mine who can't read the fine print, I'll just summarize. So since January of this year, coal use is down 10% around the planet. Natural gas use is down by 4% around the planet. And renewable energy use is up by 3% around the planet. And that's an interesting comment in a lot of ways. 
no one is recommending that COVID is a good way to transition your economy. In fact, if we think about the trillions of dollars lost, this is probably the most expensive possible way to cut emissions. But it does highlight something interesting. It highlights that if there's a real push, in this case economic, we can actually change our emissions profile dramatically. If you think about coal and gas use down by 14% in total, and we need to get down by 80%, we did this in an ugly way in a few months. So if we put our minds to it, getting our emissions down should surely be possible. And the fact that green energy, renewable energy use is up during this downtime in the global energy mix is a fascinating version. What it says is that the free cost of the fuel means that governments around the planet are using their renewables and minimizing their use of fossil fuels. Now, this is not the path to decarbonize, but it speaks to the resilience of clean energy relative to dirty energy. And the story gets kind of even more interesting as we go further, because this is the only graph that has an equation on it, I promise. Uh, but it's an equation that probably most of you know, because this is the mathematical writing of so-called Moore's Law. Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel, is famous for having said, the improvement in computers goes so quickly that about 18, every 18 months, I expect we will have a factor of 10 improvement in our computing. He said it in a little more technical way. It has to do with the number of transist transistors per unit area on a chip, but it's commonly known as Moore's Law. And it's both a function of how quickly we make devices better. And it is part of the reason why your cell phones and things become obsolete, why um, Apple and um, IBM have the gall to try to bring out new computers and get you to buy new ones on a regular basis. They're trying to make money, but they're also reflecting this thing of Moore's Law. Well, in the area of technology, we consider Moore's Law to be an example of a larger rule called the learning curve. This graph shows that learning curve. This is not a graph in the normal sense of, of some quantity, in this case, cost of electricity against time. Time is just a stamp along the curve. What we're plotting here is the cost on the x-axis versus the total amount, in this case, of solar panels manufactured and used around the world on the y-axis. And what we see is this wonderfully steady decline. There are some bumps and dips, but overall what we're saying is the cost in the future versus the cost today is directly proportional to the change in that manufacturing volume. And this brings the price down. It means that places like California and Germany that want to bet on solar can be, see a quite predictable cost decline. And of course, the more that we use policy or technology to make solar or batteries or electric vehicles cheaper, the more we can expect that cost decline. And we can use that to push technologies into the market. So here we are during this horrible days of COVID. And this is a map of the United States showing what's the least cost form of energy if you want to install a project tomorrow morning. So we call the overnight cost. So just to kind of make it easier for you, if you can't read the fine print, the rust color is where natural gas is the cheapest. There's a small pocket where nuclear is cheapest, although that's complicated because that cost doesn't take into account the reprocessing, the end of life issues. There's a large area in the middle of the country where wind is the cheapest and where I'm from up here in Ithaca, New York, in the Appalachians, that's the lowest cost. And there's areas where solar is the cheapest. You'll notice that except for right here in the Bay Area, where there's some purple, most of the state of California has either large scale solar uh, down in the south or natural gas being the cheapest. That's if you wanted to buy new hardware off the shelf. Now there's a number of factors that are interesting here. One is that if you, if you want to install solar on your roof or large scale solar as California's utilities are buying and Texas is buying, you can often get those things installed up and running in under a year. Whereas a new gas plant takes longer, nuclear can take a decade. You'll notice coal is not the least cost anywhere on this chart. And this is with no price in carbon. 
no emissions penalty. Now, California, that's not our economics. In Texas, in Wyoming, in New Mexico, they don't have a price of carbon, but we do. In California, the price is $20 a ton. So if I put that into this calculator here, and this is a calculator run by University of Texas, this is at $20 a ton, and you can see that the areas in particular for solar have expanded. I'll go back and forth so you can see that change. And that shows you in the places like California and strangely enough, our carbon partner, Quebec, um, where here we have a map where natural gas is a really small part of the equation, but it's mainly green, wind, solar. And again, that little bit of nuclear persists up here. And even this price, this is the market price in California, is not what my economist friends would use. They actually think the price of carbon should be more than double that due to its environmental impact. Um, and that's a price that's quite a bit higher. It's about $50 a ton. They call it the social cost of carbon. And here's a world where this is a, a map of what we would have in the United States if we build new technologies using that price. And you can see it's almost all solar and wind tiny bit of gas remaining and a tiny bit of nuclear. That's a world that meets that 80%. This is actually a 95% decarbonized mix. So it really speaks to where we might get to if we took advantage of the horrific COVID situation to build back green, which we often call the Green New Deal or a green stimulus. Now, solar has already gotten cheap, but we're, we're not even at the end. We haven't even come to um, the least cost of solar. We have transparent solar panels that are now entering the market. So office buildings, windows can have solar. We have solar that's now being sold in jackets and garments so you can actually recharge your devices. And while I don't like the name of this one at all, a very popular new technology is what's called photovoltaics. So this is putting solar on reservoirs and places. Turns out to be very beneficial for fish to have places where um, fish really love the edges here, but often there's reservoirs around the world where, we, where we're now seeing this installed. Very low cost, uh, minimizing space use, there's all kinds of interesting features. But this is all highlighting that the least cost and the most diverse world of solar is even yet to come. We haven't even gotten to all the things yet. Interestingly enough, energy storage is, is progressing in the same way. I'll show you the graph in a second. But one of the projects that I worked on with Southern California Edison is to use a model in my lab called SWITCH. It's a model of the power system. And we used it to set a requirement like that clean energy target that um, I showed for California. In this case, there's a requirement to add a little bit of storage into the mix. This is a plant that was designed by a team. It's a spin out company from Caltech. Here's the solar panels that power these two large batteries. These are very interesting batteries. Unlike your phone, which has only a few thousand cycles before it degrades quite significantly due to some material science questions, the liquid in these tanks here doesn't change for millions of cycles. And that's made this technology very attractive um, on the grid. And in fact, over the last few months, the California Regulatory Agency, the Public Utilities Commission, has rejected requests by companies to build new natural gas. And instead, they've awarded those contracts to companies building things like this, solar and energy storage. And so it really highlights that in the market today, we are seeing this transition. And it really harkens back to this map where the least cost technology, certainly in California's world at $20 a ton, this is a world where the role of fossil fuels, including gas, considered the cleanest, is really leaving the system. And so we are seeing some dramatic changes. Now, one of the places, sadly, where we need to be much more thoughtful and aggressive, and this is one where not all of you will agree with me um, in terms of how challenging it is, is that California has a horrific housing situation. We all know how expensive housing is, that affects us all but it in particular affects the, lead, the lowest income Californians. And this is really the, the mandate, the issue of what we call environmental justice. And so twice in the last two years, working with state Senator Scott, Scott Wiener from San Francisco, we've introduced versions of a bill, it's called Senate Bill 50, 
that has called for uh, California to build infill housing near transit hubs, near the light rail in LA, near the BART stations in the Bay Area. And we've done this on the argument that we need infill housing and we need rent controlled housing that you only can access or some fraction of it you can only access if you're low income. So for example, you're 200% of the poverty line and we would reserve a third of the units for these low income residents because the poorer you are, to get a place to either buy or more likely rent, you have to drive. And it's really a case in California where you drive till you qualify. And so we have many people who are living in Tracy, working in Silicon Valley. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, this bill on both the Democrat and Republican side has failed. Senate Bill 50 has been opposed by homeowners that don't want to see infill low income housing. And so clearly this is not one we have agreement yet. But it is one that affects our lowest income Californians the most. And it means that the people um, who are having to drive often an hour and a half each way spend the least time with their families, least time with their kids. And so this really fits in, but it's again, it's one of the areas where opinions aren't gonna be all lined up, but we haven't done enough. Another example is actually in the solar space. And I'll make this my last example. So as a project I did, with two former postdocs. Debbie is now a professor at Tufts in engineering. Uh, Sergio is debating between faculty offers right now. He's doing pretty well. He has a faculty offer at um, UC Merced. He has a faculty offer at Notre Dame and a faculty offer at Texas. And he's supposed to decide uh, by the end of the week which one he's going to. So for this project, we work with Google and they have done a mapping of 60 million rooftops across the country. And what they found is where the solar is, what we did was to combine that with census data, and we found very disappointingly, but probably not surprisingly to any of you, that if you look who has solar and who doesn't, you, we see much more solar on the rooftops of white Caucasian families than on, um, than on um, African American or Latino families. That probably is not a surprise, but what is a surprise, and it really surprised me, was that even when you control for people's income, which we did using um, uh, data from the census, but it's also quite protected because obviously knowing people's income is sensitive information. So we use that data. And what you sadly find, I'll just jump to the answer, is that in an area which is dominated by white people, um, solar is 20% more common than a, in a neighborhood that doesn't have any particular ethnic majority. In a Hispanic majority community, 30% less likely than an undifferentiated uh, neighborhood. And in African American communities, 70% less likely. But it's this bottom line that was the shock to me. That's even when you control for the incomes of the houses. And so I, I was not surprised there's more solar on the more affluent neighborhoods, white neighborhoods, but I did not expect it would be this strong even when you remove that income variable. And so this has been a topic which has come up in the Green New Deal. Forbes has covered it, covered it, NPR has covered it. But it really speaks to me anyway, as, a, as I mentioned in the beginning, a mixed race family, that even when we think we're getting our clean energy into the system, we really have to find ways to think much more about how we can overcome these biases that exist. And some of the lessons we learn elsewhere, we have a big, big partnership with China and one of the things they asked us to do was to use that same model, but to help them with an interesting logistical problem. So the city of Shenzhen in Southern China decided to go and convert their entire taxi fleet to be electric. Here we have electric vehicle taxi drivers commissioning their, their vehicles. Shenzhen in under a year and a half went from less than, a, um, less than 100 EV taxis to it was over 22,000. When I just checked in last week, it's 24,000. They are at about 96% of all taxis are electric. And if you want to license a new taxi, it must be electric. So an interesting case. But the problem they had was that there are long waiting lines. And so these circles in the map of Shenzhen, just north of, of Hong Kong here, the larger the circle and the darker shows how long the wait is to get your, char your car recharged. So we built a very nice little app. It tells drivers where the queues are and the city is now using it to decide which highways 
should they install induction charging in the densest zones of taxi use, you can now drive down the road and just like your electric toothbrush, it recharges your battery while you drive so you don't have to take time out to do so and it charges you on your easy pass equivalent. And so we were able to reduce the wait time by 50% just by getting at the information. And so it's an example of something. Those of you who saw last week, Lyft in the United States, uh, uh, based here in California, is trying to catch up. Lyft announced that they will now commit to getting 100% of all Lyft vehicles there's about 2 million Lyft drivers in the country to get all of those to be electric by 2030. I would like it to be more quick than 2030, but that's the first company here to commit. Turns out India has already set a target. Um, I did an op-ed on this in the San Francisco Chronicle on Sunday, if you wanna go back to it, but it speaks to kind of some of the learning and the back and forth that we used to have under the last president. This was a real partnership between our university and those in China. And it's again, one of the casualties over the challenges we're having today. And so it really speaks to where we are. And for those who wanna get into any more details in this kind of thing, this is a green stimulus, green new deal letter that a bunch of us wrote. We're actually in an interesting process where we're now working through legislative pieces of this with a number of members of the House and Senate. Um, and it's something that you know, we're working on. Um, it's not done deal yet. It was covered in the Daily Cal, which is all that counts. And then a few other kind of other papers, but I'm most pleased that it was in the Cal. And so I think I'll just stop there. It's 10 of nine, give us some time for questions. Again, I wanna thank you all for bearing with me doing this online and just thank you and let's, let's do some chatting. All right, well, th thanks, Dan. I'll, I'll just kind of be the facilitator of the questions. First question is, when you quote power from various sources, you quote million megawatt hours, uh, but that is not a power unit. Are you talking per year? So yeah, so uh, you, you pay your utility bill here in, for each kilowatt hour, each kilowatt hour you get is, um, in, in Northern California, it costs about 22 cents. Um, it's a little more expensive in the South. And so I quoted that in the units of people's bills. Another way to think about it is that California, if you turn on all the power plants, we generate around, well, we, we both have a supply and we have a demand in the hottest summer months of about 55 billion kilowatt hours of peak demand. That's called 55 gigawatts and a big natural gas project or a big hydro or nuclear or a big solar farm is generally a half to one gigawatt in size. And so kind of two different units to think through what that means. And that is, yeah, the, uh, um, Michael Malone asked the right question. Yeah, that's annual usage for California, just the way you pay on a monthly basis for kilowatt hours uh, of energy. Okay, good. So the next, you know, what do you think about Bill Gates' plan for using nuclear waste in power plants from his Netflix show? <laughs> so we're in an interesting spot. I mentioned that nuclear has obviously strong proponents and small and strong detractors. Bill Gates is the most most vocal proponent of nuclear among the world's billionaires. Um, he owns two nuclear companies, the first of which has a contract to install their first small nuclear trial plant at a U.S. national laboratory. It's at the Idaho National Laboratory on Pocatello, Idaho, and they will install it in 2026. And because Bill is both quite wealthy, as you all know, and has these two companies, he has been promoting the use of waste as a way to bring down the cost of dealing with that waste, um, as I sort of amortize it. And we already use some nuclear waste. We've launched spaceships to Saturn, it's called Cassini, that was powered by radioactive mix, um, but a tiny amount. It was actually just a few kilos of waste. The challenge in the United States is that while Bill Gates and many others are pushing for what are quite small nuclear plants, not that gigawatt size I mentioned, but a tenth of that, 
Um, and those small nuclear plants are designed to be cheaper to build and to build more of them. So we use that learning curve. But because nuclear takes so long today, very few people think nuclear, even if we decide to push ahead with it, and of course there's a big debate about that, that nuclear will probably not play much of a role on that 2050 target, but nuclear may play a larger role in the later decades. And so again, this is an area where opinions really vary, but it's, it's kind of the push-pull. And this is the first time, just like private space launches, just like um, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson vying to send commercial uh, payloads into space, like we just went to the space station, those same individuals are also investing in a private sector, a new wave of nuclear, whereas all nuclear up until about 10 years ago was all financed by national governments. Now we're seeing this private sector push into nuclear. And so proponents, optimists for nuclear think, well, this will change the story. And others think, no, we haven't solved nuclear's more fundamental problems. And so there's a real divided view on this. Very good, okay. And then the next question is, how much does COVID threaten a transit-centric zero emissions model of the future? So this is a neat question. That's why I brought up the example of Lyft. On the one hand, people may be very much less likely to get into someone else's car in the future due to, um, due to COVID. On the other hand, young people have found um, Ubers and Lyfts and the other versions to be incredibly efficient and very convenient to use. And getting rid of the price of that car has been worth it to them. And so while we are in the throes of COVID now, there's a number of groups that are really betting on the ride sharing, the gig economy as a way to go in the future. So what Lyft has done is certainly a very green example of that, whether it survives the same post COVID due to illness issues, we will see. Ride hailing companies are back very close to their pre COVID levels in the cities in China where they're permitted. Wuhan has not yet opened this up fully, but many other Chinese have seen a dramatic bounce back and they're doing things like having a requirement that the car be wiped down between, between riders. And so we'll see. Um, my suspicion is that it won't in the long run dent the gig economy much, but obviously I'm just uh, pontificating, I don't know. Very good. Just a reminder, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat and uh, we will get through them. The next one is, do you think the budding nuclear fission companies will ever make it past legislative red tape? Yeah. So Madeline is quite the expert here. She not only has that, but she asked about some specific technologies. Um, the ones I just mentioned, these smaller nuclear plants, that's her second comment, SMR. That stands for Small Modular Reactor. Um, and molten salt is a large scale reactor, but it's one that has some very nice properties. As you all know, um, molten materials can often hold a lot of heat. And so this molten salt and then a kind of a sister plant, a, mol a liquid metal, remember terminator and the liquid metal terminator, they can, they can a very high heat capacity. And so the benefit of this technology is that if there is an accident, you can move a lot of heat away from the core. And so there is this new interesting world of technologies out there, but Madeline's first question is the one where I think there's a real problem. And again, I'm saying this as a professor of nuclear engineering. I do not actually think that our current technology can get through the red tape. And probably for a good reason. The, the reason is this, that our current reactors, and there is about 420 nuclear reactors around the world, a hundred of them are in the United States, 60 are in France. So if you take just those two countries, we are the dominant part of the nuclear equation. Those plants were all designed in the 60s and 70s and early 80s. And the United States has not built a new nu nuclear plant and brought it to the market since 1996. That's when the last plant went in. So we haven't built a new plant in 25 years. There's new technology, but licensing for nuclear is a very slow process. 
on the order of a decade. So I don't think our current plants will make it through, but the ones that Madeline mentions, these other designs might get there, but it's gonna be well more than a decade. Now, one last comment is that she mentioned nuclear fission. That's uranium or another technology, another um, um, element, thorium. I actually think that the, U, that the world is likely to be very much powered by nuclear fusion by 2070. And I would even go as far as to say the world might be 70 or more percent nuclear fusion, but half that fusion will be 93 million miles away, meaning the sun will do the fusion, we will do the solar. But I suspect, and I would guess that by the 2070s, long after I'm gone, nuclear will be the dominant part of our equation, but a mixture of solar and nuclear. Very good. The next question, which you may see there, Dan, are what are your thoughts on energy storage that relies on solar power and concrete blocks and cranes? Is this innovative technology realistic for the US? So this is, a, this is actually a, a spin out from Caltech. This company is called um, um, Energy Vault and it's a wonderful idea. It's just simply that as we get more and more solar and wind, and of course solar is during the day by definition, we don't get solar at night, at least here. And so the more solar and wind we install, the smaller its market value going forward. After all, if we all had solar on the roof, the market price would drop to zero or even negative when there's too much solar. So one of the reasons for electric vehicles is you can charge them up whenever you want. So they are a wonderful sponge for that renewables. That gives them a value. At the same time, California is one of the world leaders in pumped hydro, meaning that when there's excess power or when there's cheap power, we pump water uphill. Pinecrest and many other places are places where we store energy in the form of water and then let it out um, through the dam when we need it. And this is not about energy, this is about economics because it costs just as much energy to pump water uphill at night and during the day, but the price of energy drops dramatically at night when demand goes down. And so if you have, for example, lots of wind blowing at night or nuclear plants that you can't turn down, they ramp up the amount that we pump up uphill and then we bring it down in the afternoon on a hot day when we need it. So what this company, um, Energy Vault, did was they said, well, last time I checked, California is a desert. Why in hell are we pumping water uphill, which is a scarce commodity? Why don't we pump something that's plentiful uphill? And so they pump rock uphill. What they have is they have cranes and big 20-ton blocks. When there's excess power, they use it to raise the blocks up. And then when we need power, they bring them back down. In Austria and in um, New Zealand, they're doing that same thing, but using railroad cars with full of rock. And they pump, they fill it up, they fill the railroad car up when there's excess energy, they pump, they run it up the tracks and they bring it back down. And I think this is actually something which makes perfect sense because it's a wonderful complement, and it's very low cost. Um, you just need an erector machine, you need a crane and blocks and you can move it up. And of course that storage lasts forever. Um, your battery and your phone degrades, but those blocks, when they're up there, they can just sit there. Interesting. All right, next question from Madeline again. Even with the cheaper cost, more use of renewables, how will we maintain the lower emission levels globally from the impact of COVID-19 on the economy once we see a return to more business as usual activities, particularly the return of industrial manufacturing and transportation use? Yeah, so th th this was that slide I tried to show, showing energy use um, in different countries in 2019 and 2020. And we are already seeing exactly what Madeline highlights here, and that is that we're relaxing back to the baseline. In the United States, we cut our emissions at peak during COVID by about 15%. China cut by 25%, but we're already back to within around seven or 8% of our baseline levels. And so we are in fact, restarting the old economy. 
So the reason why we wrote that green stimulus is because as you've seen, presidents are talking about big stimulus packages. And instead of just giving the money away, we've recommended that once you give away to low income individuals, that what you also then do is invest in these green technologies. And in the old days, even if solar was cheap, it wouldn't get you all the way you needed to go because you needed storage. But storage prices, as we were talking about, have now also dropped. These uh, blocks uphill, lithium ion. So now we can actually install solar or wind and storage. And that combination is now in much of the country at or below the price of fossil fuels. And so we are at a point where if governments choose, they could do so. And of course, the US government has not done so, but South Korea and Germany and Austria and France have all invested and they've all made part of their COVID recovery based on green energy, both for climate reasons and for the health reasons that are most strongly affecting minorities and low income individuals. All right, well, we're right at about an hour and it uh, looks like that's the end of the questions. And Dan, I wanna thank you. I uh, wish you were here in person uh, at the Camp Gold or Camp Blue stage. I think we all wish that. But we really appreciate your contribution to the lair uh, in the past and look forward to having you up here again. And on behalf of everyone on the call, thank you very, very much. Thank you for your patience in this format. I really appreciate. Um, just wonderful to, to see. So I really can't thank you enough for being on. And I have put a few of the things in the chat box. Yeah, there's a link to nice. the event in the chat box and check out everything. Uh, have a great thanks night, so everybody. And thanks for joining us. And uh, come back next week for another great speaker. Thank you. Thanks so much.